I'm gonna take you through one of the most difficult topics to understand within combat sports training, and that is the idea of conditioning, specifically low intensity versus high intensity conditioning. Recently, there's been a big push towards zone two or low intensity conditioning to improve sports performance, but there is research and evidence to suggest that you may need to spend more time in the higher intensity ranges. Now, this can be confusing. You don't know if you should be doing going for your long runs every day or if you should be doing sprints. Many people gravitate towards doing something that is hard versus something that is easy, but I'm gonna run through some of the theory and some of the practical knowledge around conditioning and then how you can use it to benefit your training. First, I'm gonna address the idea of energy systems. And energy systems are often used to prescribe conditioning. Now, I've done it myself. I do that within some of the programs just because it's easy to label, but there can be some issues with programming through energy systems. Firstly, we cannot isolate an energy system. All three energy systems, or all three main energy systems, work together no matter what the activity is. For example, typically we look at the 100 meter sprint or a short 10 second sprint as purely alactic in nature, meaning we're using uh, phosphocreatine stores and ATP to produce this energy and to produce it fast enough for high power outputs. However, doing these 10 second sprints, for example, you see a huge drop in muscle oxygen saturation, indicating that there is a large aerobic component to these sprints as well. This illustrates the point that all three energy systems interplay within each other. If you're more interested in some of this energy system talk, I recommend listening to the podcast with Vern Gambetta, and he talks about the interplay of energy systems and how you can uh, perform your conditioning to develop energy systems in that way. Now, I like to think of conditioning low and high intensity on a spectrum. So this spectrum is typically taken from high intensity interval training, but I've put in energy system labels under each one as well, so you can see where they all align. So under our low intensity side, you typically have your low intensity steady state cardio, also known as cardiac output, also known as zone two conditioning. Within the high intensity interval training model, you also have your long HIIT, and that's typically, for example, eight minutes at 90 to 100% of max heart rate, and you're repeating those intervals. We can move further up into our next notch, that's our short high intensity interval training intervals. Now we're looking at one to two minutes for it, as an example, it can be a little longer. And we could also throw in there in terms of energy system labeling, we can call this aerobic power threshold intervals, for example. Then we have repeated sprint training as we get further up. We could also label this as anaerobic lactic, but remember, this is not just targeting the anaerobic lactic energy system, it's targeting all the energy systems, but it's just a simple way of labeling this type of training. And then we finally have sprint interval training, which is our most intense style of conditioning. You could also label this a lactic power or capacity depending on the rest periods and how long the work intervals are. Now where you do perform your conditioning on the spectrum depends on many factors. One of them being how close or far away you are from a fight. It also takes into account your body type makeup, muscle fiber type. Are you a fast twitch or slow twitch dominant athlete? And we'll dive into that in a bit. It also takes into account your current level of fitness. If you are very out of shape, maybe you spent two years out of training for whatever reason, jumping straight into a high intensity mode of conditioning may not be the best idea. And finally, it's going to be dictated by your total training volume and what is in, within your training sessions or your technical training sessions. So we want to fill those gaps that you're not getting. Now, typically, typically I like to do further away from say a fight, I would be sitting on either end of the spectrum within your training week. So I'll be touching on the very low end, for example, longer intervals or steady state, and then higher intensity sprint intervals with full recovery to touch on quote unquote alactic power. That gives you both ends of the spectrum and then you kind of funnel into, I wouldn't say the middle, but you'd funnel more this way into the high intensity ranges as you get closer to a fight. So another thing to touch on are the adaptations that we're trying to achieve when we're performing these types of conditioning. Now, typically on the spectrum, we prioritize different adaptations. 
but we tend to get a little bit of everything depending on where we are. So on the low intensity side, we're typically targeting central adaptations or heart adaptations. So here we're looking to improve the ability of the heart to pump more blood per heartbeat. And we're doing this by expanding the heart chamber. So in between each heartbeat, this chamber is bigger now, it can now pull more blood, it can then pump more blood per heartbeat. That is the general idea being on this low end of the spectrum. Now, however, we can still develop some of that cardiac output through high intensity means. It seems that the recovery periods between high intensity intervals can also fully fill that heart chamber with blood, stretching it to improve cardiac output. So just remember that you can develop some of these adaptations throughout the spectrum, but targeting this low intensity side will preferentially target that uh, adaptation that you're after. Now, you're also going to improve oxygen utilization within the muscle, so your muscle oxidative capacity through building more blood vessels. So typically with this side, you're going to get both peripheral within the muscle and central within the heart adaptations, but you're preferentially targeting the central side. On the higher intensity side, you're preferentially targeting the muscle oxidative capacities. You're looking at peripheral adaptations on this side. Now, what is very interesting is research that came out of Dr. John Babry, Andrew Usher's lab, Abate University. Again, I recommend you check out that podcast as well to get a really deep insight into the sprint interval training. But typically when we're doing long-term high intensity training, we see aerobic capacity max out relatively quickly. So for example, take the original Tabata study, four to five times a week of high intensity sprint intervals. We see VO2 max max out at about four weeks. So aerobic capacity caps and doesn't move any further. And then we see anaerobic capacity max out at around six weeks and we don't see any further adaptations. But that is using one protocol. If you're changing protocols or even using the same protocol within the, the studies they did, we see that, okay, VO2 max or aerobic capacity maxes out in a couple of weeks, but subjects still improve their time to exhaustion tests. And they indicated that while aerobic or central adaptations may max out, we can still improve the peripheral adaptations or the fatigue resistance of the muscles. So essentially down this end, we're improving the muscle's ability to use oxygen and reducing the time to fatigue. So let's talk advantages and disadvantages of all these different approaches. So down this end on the low end, the advantage is it's low stress. You can do a fair amount of volume on this end without severely impacting your technical training. It is why it is often said that you should do a lot of zone two to improve these adaptations without impacting or negatively impacting the technical training. Now, the argument against that is doing a lot of volume of something or something repetitive can potentially lead to overuse injury. So bear that in mind. Down this end, the advantage of sprint interval training it's short, you don't need the same volumes as you do down this end. This end you need hours in a week to be able to make improvements. Plus, once you start making improvements, to continue making improvements, you need to add more volume. And at some point the volume becomes too much for you to be able to handle or too much where you have to take away from your technical fight training to be able to do it and that becomes a problem. Down this end, we can do these sessions in 10 to 15 minutes twice a week and you can still make gains within the sprint interval training. Now, one of the disadvantages with this is one, it is damn hard. You have to get yourself up to be able to do these at max intensity. Two, it's gonna depend on your muscle, muscle fiber type as well. So within the spectrum, taking into account, I mentioned about muscle fiber type already, but a very quick breakdown, typically a fast twitch or slow twitch dominant athletes. You have three main muscle fiber types, but you have other hybrid fiber types, but this stuff doesn't really matter in terms of this, but there are a few tests you can do to determine potentially where you fall in that spectrum. However, they're not very good. So typically you will know whether you're a more fast twitch or slow twitch dominant athlete. Typically most people are in between, an intermediate style athlete. Typically you might find strikers fall on the more fast twitch dominant side, grapplers might fall more on the slower twitch dominant side, but you will likely know by how quickly you gas out if you're powerful, if you're strong, if you can jump very high, etc. Those things are typical indicators for being someone who is a twitchy athlete. Now, the problem is if you are very fast twitch dominant, 
if you spend a lot of time down in this very high intensity conditioning area, it's gonna take you a long time to recover. So research shows it can take you greater than five hours to recover from a high intensity bout like this. The problem is if you're stacking high intensity bouts on top of technical training, you dig yourself further and further into a hole because you aren't able to fully recover between sessions. So for that type of athlete, you may look to be a little more down this end because it's lower stress, you can recover from it, plus you're plugging gaps in your performance that you may need to, to improve performance. Whereas someone who's a more slower twitch dominant style athlete, doing more of this may not benefit you that much. You already have the oxidative capacity, you're already fit, quote unquote, and you need the ability to be able to express power and express it quickly, and that means you may spend more time down this end, even when you're further away from a fight. And because you are more of a slow twitch dominant athlete, you recover much faster than someone who is more fast twitch dominant. I think some good examples of fast twitch dominant athletes within combat sports, Yoel Romero within MMA, Jordan Burroughs within wrestling, Tank Davis within boxing would typically fit the profile of someone who was a little more on the fast twitch side. On the slow twitch side, you're looking at someone like Khabib Nurmagomedov, you're looking at Gordon Ryan within grappling potentially. You're even looking at Nate Diaz within MMA boxing as well as more slower twitch dominant style athletes. So you can kind of use those as guides for comparing their style with your style. So the question becomes, where do you fit this stuff within your training? Now, typically, if you're looking at low intensity, steady state cardio style training, better served for a recovery workout or session, or if you're really out of shape, then you would use a low intensity steady state approach because you can just move the needle that little bit. It's easy way to decide whether you need to do that is just look at resting heart rate. If your resting heart rate is over 60, 65, then typically doing something like this will bring it down relatively quickly with very little stress. Now, if you do have a good training background, you're relatively in shape, a long high intensity interval approach is probably a better option. I'm in the process of updating a lot of these suits of finding underground programs to align with this change in thought process that I've had. Um, so just check, make sure you check that out that is currently going on. But you're looking at doing your lower intensity conditioning or your longer conditioning sessions one to two times a week. Where you fit that is typically dependent on your schedule, of course, but you're looking at standalone days because these are longer sessions or standalone sessions, I should say. So you can do these in the morning for example, and then in the evening you're doing your technical training because it's not as stressful as doing something like your high intensity work. Your high intensity training, you're typically looking at one to two times a week dependent. So a, a good way to, to go about this, is if you are very far away from a fight, you can go two sessions of this a week and one session of this a week, and that will give you enough time to be able to fit all your technical training and other strength training in. Now with your high intensity interval training, or your very high intensity training, so for example, sprint interval training, the best time to do these is directly after your gym or strength training. That way you're not having to fit another session in. You're already quote unquote warmed up through the strength training and it complements it well. So typically just jumping on a bike for 10 minutes doing your 10 second sprints or whatever it is, fits well within a week and you get that high intensity stimulus with your high intensity strength training stimulus. So all packs together. Another option is to even do it after sparring. I think Gary Hart does that with his GB boxes. Um, Andrew Usher does that with some of his boxes as well. Obviously it depends on your sparring session and what equipment you have available, but that is another option you can do as well. So you put all your high intensity stress into one session in one day to allow you to recover the following day. So for example, if Friday was your very big uh, sparring day or big session, you might do that on a Friday after sparring. And then the Saturday might be off or might be a low intensity recovery style session there. So it kind of depends on your training week. As you get closer to a fight, you might flip this on its head. You might only do one of these as a recovery. You might even do more higher intensity aerobic work, depending. And then you might do two of these sprint intervals or high intensity intervals per week to get you up to speed. A final thing to say is around the idea of high intensity technical training. So while we can get hard sparring or hard rounds in, often this still sits within that middle intensity. You can go much harder on a sprint on a bike versus during technical training because obviously the technical training depends on what is happening within that role or within that round. 
So just bear that in mind that sometimes sparring may still may not even be enough to reach these very high intensities. Now, if you go down in the description, there's a link to the Sweet Science Fighting Underground, has all the training programs that are being updated, has the online courses, and it has the private Discord community. But if you like this video, if you have any questions, please throw them down in the comments. It'll just give me more content that I can create for you. <laughs>